Until this point in our retelling of A Song of Ice and Fire, we have neglected to mention one of the key players in this tale. To remedy this, we will now detail the trials and tribulations of Jon Snow. The bastard son of Eddard Stark was raised in acrimony, always feeling apart from those who were supposed to be his siblings, and instilled with a firm belief that unless he were to depart from Winterfell, his life would be an unfulfilled one. This upbringing would inspire this child, born in the dying embers of Robert's Rebellion, to become his own man, and in doing so, forge a path for himself which may yet have immense implications for Westeros and its people. At the conclusion of the rebellion against the Mad King, when all was said and done, Robert Baratheon sat on the Iron Throne, forever altering the course of the history of the Seven Kingdoms. Of all the dramatic twists in that seminal war, Perhaps the most surprising was that Eddard Stark, the noblest man in the realm, had besmirched the very honour he held so dear by way of siring a bastard son. Following the defeat of the Mad King and the death of his sister Lyanna, Ned made his way back to his ancestral seat of Winterfell, bringing with him not only his retinue, but also the bastard son he had named John. This drew a frosty reception from his wife Catelyn, and this animosity was only furthered by the patriarch of the Stark family's abject refusal to speak of the boy's parentage. John was raised amongst the Stark children, with Ned displaying a fierce protectiveness towards the boy, ensuring that he received an education befitting a true scion of House Stark. As a result, the bastard grew close with his true-born siblings, Rob and Arya, yet less so with Sansa, who treated him with disdain as her mother did. This relatively comfortable existence was soon to change with a portent of the coming of winter, which was encountered when the Stark retinue returned from the execution of a deserter of the Night's Watch. During their home journey to Winterfell, the party discovered a dead direwolf who had left a litter of pups. Upon Jon's suggestion, the pups were not executed, but instead given to each of the Stark children to raise. Jon received the runt of the litter, an albino pup, whom he named Ghost. Due to his bastard status, John was deemed unworthy to sit with his true-born siblings at the feast welcoming King Robert to the north. During the festivities, he spoke with Benjen Stark, the first ranger of the Night's Watch. Here, John set his heart upon joining the Brotherhood, fully aware that his prospects as a bastard were limited, even despite the kindness his father had displayed throughout the years. This process was hastened by Ned's acceptance of the title of Hand of the King, which necessitated that he head toward King's Landing. Catelyn was unwilling to keep John in Winterfell in her husband's absence, and Ned could not bring this bastard to court. Therefore, it was agreed that he would go north to the Wall. This arrangement pleased Catelyn, as due to the vows John would have to take with the Watch, he would be unable to sire sons who would challenge her own offspring's claim to Winterfell. John's dreams of joining a brotherhood of like-minded, stalwart guardians of civilization were soon dispelled, when, upon arriving at the Wall, he discovered that the Night's Watch of old had been fundamentally altered into an unrecognizable tapestry of criminals and exiles. Initially, John allowed his resentment of his current station to bleed into how he treated his fellow recruits, resulting in a confrontation between them. Only after a conversation with the armorer of Castle Black, Donal Noy, John realized he had treated the others in much the same way he had once been treated due to his status as a bastard. After this, John won the respect of his fellow recruits by displaying the characteristics of a great leader, mentor, and most importantly, friend. However, his popularity also won him the undying hatred of the master at arms, Sir Alyssa Thorne. John's closest friend at the Wall was Samuel Tarly, a rotund man most unsuited to the rigours of the Black, and who could only take his vows due to John convincing Maester Aemon to take him as his personal steward. Following the end of the training period among the recruits, John believed he had proved himself to be a worthy candidate for the Rangers. Thus, he was shocked and dismayed when Lord Commander Mormont named him his personal steward. This fury was somewhat tempered when Samwell informed John that he was being intentionally kept close at the Lord Commander's side to groom him for a leadership position. 
John and Sam decided to take their vows before a set of weirwood trees north of the wall. During this time, Ghost returned with the Hand of Jaffa flowers. This led the Brothers of the Night's Watch to their fallen companions, Jaffa and Othor, who were brought back to Castle Black. That same night, the two corpses arose as whites and came within a hair's breadth of taking the Lord Commander's life had it not been for John's timely intervention. As a reward for his valiant efforts, John was awarded Longclaw, a Valyrian steel bastard sword and treasured heirloom of the Mormont family. In recognition of House Stark's blood that ran through his veins, John had the Mormont bear's head pommel replaced with that of a direwolf. John's heart was torn apart when news reached Castle Black that Rob Stark had called his banners and marched south. Despite the counsel of Maester Aemon, who was revealed to be a Targaryen, John still decided to abandon his vows, despite the death penalty which came with it, and ride south to join his brother. He was swayed from this course of action when his friends among the Watch pursued him and convinced him to return to the Brotherhood. The following morning, the Lord Commander berated the young bastard, and, properly chastised, John fully committed to the Night's Watch. This would come at a pivotal point, serving as a crossroads for the Watch. Benjen Stark had gone missing in the interim, which in conjunction with other ill tidings from beyond the wall made Geon Mormont certain of only one true path forward. The Night's Watch would lead a ranging north in a show of force that had not been seen in generations, and discover for themselves if the casualties could be attributed to the wildlings alone or something even more sinister. The Great Ranging began with all preparations having been made. Yet the initial portents left an uncertain picture for the party. The 200-strong company from Castle Black, supplemented by a further 100 rangers from the Shadow Tower, were encountered by naught more than silence. The wildling villages they rode past, including White Tree, were abandoned. Only at Craster's Keep were they informed of a new King Beyond the Wall, who had united the fiercely independent wildlings in the Frostfangs. This man was not unknown to the Night's Watch, for it was none other than the former ranger Mance Raider, who had even visited Winterfell during Jon's youth. This news, though disheartening, did not alter the conviction of the Lord Commander, who ordered that his men continue onwards towards the Fist of the First Men. Upon their arrival at the Fist, the Night's Watch discovered that the defences were in a state of disrepair. Dior quickly ordered renovations to the site to defend against any oncoming assault, regardless of the foe which marched out to meet them. The breaches in the low ring wall were filled in with timber, while an additional set of timber stakes were set up. In addition, the slopes surrounding the hill were outfitted with caltrops. Meanwhile, while following his direwolf, John came across an old mound which Ghost dug up uncovering dragon glass weapons and an old war horn wrapped in a Night's Watch cloak, which John distributed among his brothers. Not long after, the hundred men of the Shadow Tower, led by the living legend Corin Halfhand, arrived at the Fist. Corin reported that they had been waylaid by a wildling scouting party commanded by Alfin Crowkiller. Fortunately, they prevented the wildlings from reporting the encounter to Mance though the ensuing skirmish had come at a relatively high cost, as four brothers lay slain and a further dozen wounded. A wildling prisoner Corin took during the battle subsequently informed the Lord Commander that Mance was currently searching for a form of magic capable of bringing down the wall. The Halfhand subsequently selected John to be among the three scouting parties to assess the mountain passes. The other two were commanded by Jarmin Buckwell and Thorin Smallwood respectively. Following the ascent up the treacherous mountains, Corin's party ambushed several wildling sentries in the Skirling Pass. John killed the first sentry with little difficulty, however, his blade was stayed when he discovered his second target was a woman. Rather than execute her on sight, he took the distinctly fiery-haired wildling as a captive. As they continued their trek through arduous terrain, Corin ordered John to execute the wildling sentry. Despite his duty, John's blade stayed once more, for he could not bring himself to kill an unarmed woman. Instead, John let her go free. In her parting words, the woman promised John that Mance would welcome him among the Free Folk should he ever defect from the Night's Watch to join them. 
That night, John dreamt through the eyes of Ghost, and in doing so, laid eyes upon the massive host that Munts had assembled against the Watch. Thousands of wildlings, supplemented by giants and mammoths, were shown to him, only for his vision to be cut short when an eagle attacked Ghost. John informed the group of what he saw. Surprised, the Watchmen supposed that the young bastard was a warg, an unusual talent in the current age. The situation turned from bad to worse when the Night's Watch came across a wounded ghost and spotted the eagle that had attacked the hound flying overhead. This caused Corin to decide to return to the fist with all haste. The wildlings remained in hot pursuit, and to delay them, Corin ordered Dalbridge, a veteran ranger of the Shadow Tower, to buy them as much time as possible in a desperate rearguard action. The Half-Hand further ordered Eben and Stonesnake, the other company members, to make their way to the Fist as quickly as possible to inform the Lord Commander of what they had seen. This left Corin alone with John, with the former ordering the latter to join the Wildlings and to do what was required to win their trust. Though Dalbridge fought with the true ferocity of a member of the Night's Watch, it was not long before the Wildling party, with Rattleshirt at their head, came upon the pair. John immediately yielded to their superior numbers and renounced his loyalties to the Watch, which drew the feigned disdain of his companion. Nevertheless, further proof would be required of the bastard's loyalty before the Wildlings could accept him among their number. To that end, Rattleshirt demanded that John slay the Halfhand. A duel ensued, and John was initially hard-pressed against the wily Shadow Tower veteran. Ghost intervened, mauling the warrior, and with a sufficient show put on, Corin allowed the younger man to bring an end to his watch. Although Rattleshirt was disappointed by the intervention of the direwolf, he kept his word and brought John back to their camp to meet the King Beyond the Wall. To ensure that Corin's sacrifice was not in vain, John would have to set aside his honour and vows for his imminent meeting with the Unifier of the Wildlings, an act which would not come easily to any scion of House Stark. Yet in this instance, John was fortunately able to achieve what his father could not, and set aside his principles, even momentarily, for the sake of his brothers. Although John initially did not recognize the true king beyond the wall, believing Tormund or Steer to be Mance, he quickly regained his footing and addressed the man who presented himself as not more than a bard. Now addressing the true king, John feigned anger at those who raised him for his apparent poor treatment due to his illegitimate parentage. As a result, Mance Raider could empathize with the young man, and perhaps see something of himself in the boy who seemed intent on setting aside the black. Furthermore, Mance allowed John to be privy to his plans, which would not be limited to the Night's Watch's destruction and the wall's storming. Rather, the King Beyond the Wall wished to invade the Seven Kingdoms, and in doing so, carve out a dominion for his people, free from the infighting and harsh conditions which had long engulfed the far north. However, a greater reason pushed Mance desperately to unite the disparate far north, for the long night was approaching, and the denizens of the dark, icy depths of the land of always winter were rising once more. This was a fact that those who dwelled within Westeros's Seven Kingdoms remained blissfully unaware of, including the Brothers of the Night's Watch, despite the initial reasoning behind their order's founding. These beings of myth and legend would soon become a stark reality for those camped upon the Fist of the First Men, bringing a premature end to the Great Ranging. However, this is a story for another day, and the next few videos in this series will detail the disastrous ambush upon the Fist of the First Men and John's time among the Wildlings, culminating in his return to the land of his birth and the desperate decisions which would be forced upon him as a result. But in the meantime, we're planning to cover the battles of many other fantasy, sci-fi and space opera universes, so make sure you have subscribed and pressed the bell button. Please consider liking and sharing as it helps immensely, and don't forget to comment. We'll try to read and respond to every comment, as we want to know what you think about this video and which videos you hope to see in the future. This is the Wizards and Warriors channel, and we'll catch you on the next one.